and welcome to series two of my podcast, Innovation, where we get to hear stories and experiences of incredible women in science and technology. Not only will you get insights into some fascinating innovations, but you may also even relate to their stories, especially if you're a little unconventional or non-conforming. As with all science and technology, what these women do for a living has a real impact on all of our lives, and we often don't realise it. But here on Innovation, I'm also giving women a platform for them to be heard and for us to be inspired and uplifted by what they've learned along their life's journeys, both personally and professionally. This week, I talk to Kate Todd Davis, a manufacturing engineering degree apprentice. I'm Kate Todd Davis and I'm a manufacturing engineering apprentice and I work at Rolls-Royce. Gosh, so cool that you're at Rolls-Royce. How has that been? It's been really good. Um, the role was really supportive of me and I was, to be honest, I was really nervous to start. Um, so I think there's, there's that many men that work there. I'm definitely a minority, um, but everyone's brilliant. It's honestly, it's probably the best place I could have chosen to work. Um, and I find the work really interesting as well. So yeah, it's been really good. Why did you choose to get into this industry? Um, I've always really liked science and maths and I've, I've I've just always questioned why things work um, and I, I kind of wanted to go down the path of maybe um, like just going into maths or science or like biomed science um, but then my mum she kept telling me you, you're going to be an engineer like, you know your, your skill set's perfect for it um, but when I was younger I think because there's a real misconception about what engineering is I was like reluctant to agree with her and um, so I kind of yeah, I, I, I was trying to push for what I thought I would be good at. Um, but then and in the end, it, it, she was right. <laughs> and the more I did in engineering, the more I realised that like, it was like exactly what I enjoyed. Um, so. And how did your mum know what engineering is? Um, I, I don't know, really. I think she's probably just a lot more open to like people in the industry. So she works at a college um, and the college is well it's very much engineering focused so she'd always seen what they do and obviously she's friends with some of the lecturers um, and I think she'd probably just heard them speaking about what they do and thought oh Kate would like that and um, yeah I think that's probably probably why she she was good at giving me advice because she, she gives the students advice for a living so <laughs> so yeah. That's so perfect, because honestly, um, this generation struggles to know about engineering. So kind of all yeah. the generations would be even worse kind of thing. So it's amazing that you had that guide. Um, was mm. it obvious from when you're a young kid that you would kind of go in the STEM direction? Um, I think so. Yeah. I've, I, well, I've never really liked English. I've never liked. Well, I, I liked art subjects and music, um, but science was definitely where I kind of like I just enjoyed everything science related like I like watching Brainiac science abuse and um like watching different like programs that told you how things work and um and I feel like in school so it was only really in secondary school that I was exposed to science um because in primary school yeah we, we didn't really do anything um and I think yeah the more I learned about it the more I was like oh yeah I really like this and obviously I loved maths as well um so the uh, my school was actually a stem school for while I was there it's not anymore <laughs> um but it was while I was there um, and we also we, I actually managed to speak to Helen Sharman um who was like she was the first female into space um, and I think that was probably like a moment where I was like okay I could maybe make a career out of this because she has um it's kind of you know putting yourself in in their shoes so like what kind of kid were you were you the typical lego building taking stuff apart kid no not at all oh. <laughs> um so I, well me and my sister we were like the girliest girls ever you know we had Polly pockets brats dolls but i suppose you know they did have houses and you know i like to like build the community with all my dolls and what have you um but no i, I never really i never really played with lego or anything like stimulating in that respect um, I do remember when I was younger, I, I bought, I saved my birthday money, I bought like an electrical engineering set. <laughs> um, so maybe, maybe that's where, where it all started. But um, no, generally I was the opposite, to be honest. 
Um, That's so refreshing. And I love the idea that you're really girly and then you're working from yeah. Rolls Royce. Um, how have you sort of navigated being girly in a very male dominated environment? Um, I, I think with some of the, I, I hate to generalise, but I think the older generation are probably less accepting of women in engineering not to say that's all of them just in my experience if there ever has been someone to like question like why I was there or what I was doing or like oh can you lift that can you do that it's always been like an older an older an older man (laughs) um but in general I haven't really there hasn't been that many challenges to be honest I feel like the, the way the world is at the moment, everyone is a lot more accepting. Um, and obviously, if you can prove yourself and you can show what you're capable of, people can't dispute that. Um, so I think being girly, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It just means I have to get up a bit earlier to do my hair or put some makeup on. But that's just something that I choose to do. Not that I've never feel, felt made to do anything or made uncomfortable at work. It's always been really inclusive. Gosh, I find that so fascinating because um, for me personally, uh, the fact that I was girly was something that I almost hid at work. Like I didn't want to draw attention to a beautiful pair of shoes that I'd bought, you know, or (laughs) wear makeup because it would kind of make me feel even less like the people around me at work. So I really admire your confidence to go, but I love doing that. So why wouldn't I do that? I mean, um, I think one of the things about being female and girly is that um, if you do spend an hour getting ready in the morning because you really want to do that for you, um, the end result is the way you look makes people judge maybe how intelligent you are or whether you can do, you know, an engineering job. Like, have you experienced that and how do you deal with it? Um, I think, I, I mean, to be honest, I, like you say, I do it for myself. Like I just do it because I feel more comfortable when I've got makeup on and like I, I wouldn't dream of going into work just like rolling out of bed. <laughs> um, but that's just like a, to make me feel more comfortable. Um, I, I think pe- people probably do like prejudge and they probably think, you know, why why is she doing this? Why is she in here? Um, but I've never, I've never... Oh, felt like that was an issue and I I don't feel like anyone has really looked at me well I don't know but I I don't feel like everyone's ever looked at me and thought oh like she's you know she's she's got too much makeup and she's got like why why is her hair curled I mean people make comments be like oh you look nice today and I'm like well what's it to you you know (laughs) um but I don't know at the end of the day that I think I think I've got enough respect now that they don't really well they'll never say anything they don't really care it's probably just maybe when I first went in it was kind of like oh a girl like what why why is she here what's she doing because you know people talk and I do stick out like well I think my hair as well because having like a brighter colored hair makes me stick out but um yeah being being a girl definitely you, you definitely do get more questions at the start but yeah like I say it's just about kind of proving yourself and making people realize like I am more than how I look and but I think it's the same for everyone you know men probably have to deal with the same thing I think underneath all of that is just a real self-belief like I think it's it's coming across like you just so believe in your engineering skills that you don't let the way you look and the fact that you're female talk louder than your inner ability yeah I mean I think maybe it's I I kind of sometimes like unintentionally overcompensate because I think I don't want to be judged because I'm a woman and I don't want to so say when I got the job um in my intake there was 10 apprentices um, and three of us are, are women but I was the only technical apprentice who was a woman um, and same at university, I was the only girl in my class, so I was one of 50. Um, and it's it, it was more so that I don't want to fit the stereotype that women shouldn't be there. So I almost overcompensate to say, like, I need to prove, you know, why we should be there and why, you know, we're, we're worthy to have a job in engineering type thing. 
Um, so I think that's probably where the belief might come from because I've yeah I, I always try and like do the best that I can and like you know put my all into something so nobody can ever question like oh you're slacking off you you know you, you don't know what you're talking about um because that would be like my, my worst nightmare um so I think that's probably my like my own almost my defense mechanism of trying to like prove that I should be there so if that makes yeah. sense so prove that you're all woman um, in the way you look, but prove that you're absolutely, you have every right to be there by really stepping up and and showing your abilities. Yeah, at the end of the day, I, like, I just want to be good at my job. And I think as long as I am, it doesn't really matter about anything else. That's really, really inspiring. Um, so tell me about the apprenticeship. Um, you know, you talk about being very strong in maths and science. Why did you then decide to take an apprenticeship route as opposed to uh, going straight to uni and, and doing that full time? Um, so in college, they, they, they did actually kind of push me down the uni route because um, I was I was quite like academically strong with science and maths. So I think they were thinking, oh, she can go into like I don't know, so that, you know, one of the Russell Group unis and, and study a really academic subject. Um, and I, it's not that I didn't consider that because I did. and I, I did apply to university, but it was always in the back of my mind. It was a backup um, because um, I actually did some work experience at the like the power, the nuclear power station, which is local to me. And I was on like a mentoring scheme there. Um, and after that, when I'd seen like industry and seen um, what I could be doing, I kind of thought, what's the point in going back into a classroom when I could be in industry? Um, and then, so after I did that, I then sought more work experience at Caterpillar as well, which is quite local. Um, and I really enjoyed that. And they gave me like a practical task of designing a bracket on like a CAD system, which I'd never used before. Um, we used a 3D printer to like kind of put it into practice. And again, I'd, I've never seen any of this before. Because um, like my A levels were maths, physics, and chemistry, so it was it didn't really prepare me for engineering. Um, so I think those type of experiences and exposure, that's what kind of gave me the drive to to really go for an apprenticeship. And obviously, there's the added benefit of not being in debt and um, being able to work and go to uni and do the same at once. Because I've got a degree in three years. I've, I've I've done. Have I've had the same timeline as my friends who have gone to uni. I'm just got a job as well. So it's really, really smart. Like what you've chosen to do is really, really smart. So how did you manage to get a degree in three years? Because normally it's like this mad combination of like degree working. You know, it just sounds absolutely intense. Like walk me through. Um, First of all, where are you located in the UK? Um, how old are you? And like, where exactly in the whole apprenticeship um, uh, structure are you? Yeah, so at the moment, I'm 21. I'm 22 next week, actually. Oh. Um, and I'm in my fourth year of my apprenticeship. So the apprenticeship I'm on is a it's manufacturing engineering degree apprenticeship. Um, and I'm based up in Washington in the northeast. So... I applied for the job for Washington, but then I get sent, well, I got sent to uni in Sheffield. So it was quite a, 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 a the traveling was a lot. Um, but so I started the degree when I was 18, when I started at Rolls-Royce. Um, and then, so for the first year of my apprenticeship, I went to a, a like a technical college in Sunderland. Um, and they kind of taught me like all of the basic engineering principles. So I got a level two in that, which obviously seemed to go backwards because I just came out of my A levels, um, but because I'd never done engineering before, I felt like that was that was needed. <laughs> like I, I I didn't know what milling or turning was, which obviously now I seem stupid saying that because it's like what we do at work. Um, so yeah, so that that technical side, though it was like a step down level wise, um, it was definitely necessary. Um, but at the same time, I, I went on day release to Sheffield Uni. So we had 10 hour uni days, which was a lot. Um, and obviously the study outside of university was a lot as well. Um, it wasn't for the faint hearted, <laughs> but at, at the same time, I, 
it's all done and it's, it's I got it in three years I didn't have to prolong it for four or five which I know some of my um some of my friends who are apprenticeships like um they're like five year degrees which is you know that, that's a long time <laughs> um so yeah that that's how it worked really it was just kind of a, me managing my time outside of work and uni to keep up to speed with uni um but work have always been really understanding say when I've had deadlines they've said you know work from home and in the last hour or something of the day start uni work um which I did and I was on furlough for six months in 2020 so that was it was a long it was a long period um but I did have university so it was kind of a blessing in disguise for me because I had I was basically a full-time uni student um so you know I had that time to like really catch up to make all the notes and the lectures that I wanted to make before but didn't have time um and I, it, it, I think it did reflect in my grade I did do like particularly well that year but at the same time like I I got out of it what I wanted at the end whilst I was working as well. Um, so it's just it was just a, a matter of balancing everything. Um, which yeah, it was it was a challenge, but it was worth it definitely. Out of your industrial experience, what were the highlights? Um what, like what did you love learning the most or experiencing? There's nothing that I've really hated doing. I think it's all been interesting, it's all been worthwhile. Um I do like the the, the more technical sides of it um so say creating like processes and um looking at like CAD models um and seeing that almost kind of like sit telling the operator how it's going to be made and then actually seeing it being made I find that's quite like a rewarding process um because in, in the role I'm in it's very much office based so there isn't an awful lot on the shop floor um like in everyday work but I think when it does translate to the shop floor and you do actually like see the end product I think that's probably like the most rewarding part of the job and obviously like if you've done it as well it, you get like a, a real sense of achievement um yeah I've, I've enjoyed most of it though I think the I like digital as well that's really interesting and I think there's a lot of scope for more development in the digital um like environment at the moment so whenever there's a project in that kind of like area um, I've always kind of put my name forward and saying you know I'd get involved with that um, yeah I think it's just bringing new things in as well so the team I'm actually going to be coming out of my apprenticeship in is new product introduction um, so it's bringing in all of the new products essentially um, but it's, I think that's the most interesting because you kind of get to see it like from cradle to grave so you get to see like the the, the definition um, and then exactly how we're going to machine it, how it's going to be produced. And then obviously at the end of however long that takes, um, you see the part. So it's really important. Are you into cars? Yeah. 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 Even yeah. before the apprenticeship? Yeah. So um, I actually, the Rolls Royce um, business we were, I work in is aerospace. Um, so it's, it's slightly different, but yeah, I've, I've always been into cars. I think that's one thing that's definitely been consistent. Um, like I love my cars. Um, I went to Santa Pod when I was younger as well and watched the drag racing. Um, I say younger, I probably was about like 14, so I wasn't that young. Um, and yeah, so like my dad and my uncle, they like took me down to like the pits and we saw like all the cars and, and there was actually a Rolls Royce jet engine there in, in like a, a case. Um, and my uncle said to me, he's like, have you, have you not considered Rolls Royce? And I was like, mm, no. <laughs> um, so that's probably where I kind of discovered Rolls Royce as an aerospace company rather than as a car manufacturer, which I think is what they're most known as. Um but no, like I, I always love cars. I'm going the F1 this year, which I'm really excited about. Oh wow! Um, yeah, um, and yeah, and planes as well. I've always been intrigued by planes and just aerospace in general. I think it's a, a really interesting industry, and I, I don't, I can't see myself working in any other industry other than either aerospace or automotive. That's definitely where I, like my interests lie, and like I'd like to stay. <laughs> In all of your experiences, what is manufacturing to you? Um, I, th I think it's making something simple, 
and kind of putting a lot of time and effort and obviously machining it so like taking metal out to make it really intricate and I, th- I think that's that that's the way I always see it is you you start off with a big lump of metal and you put loads of processes and you know you put chemicals and like mich- mich- tools and everything like that into it and then you come out with this like shiny intricate perfectly manufactured part really um because I, I think especially in the factory I work they're, they're quite intricate and we, we do have a lot of like critical features that you know if they're not right a plane will come down and it's kind of there is a lot of onus on it and you, you do have to be like hyper aware of say what you do to make sure it is right but at the same time I think that almost makes it more rewarding when you get it right so um so yeah I think in simple terms it's just getting a big lump of metal putting loads of effort and time into it and then you get out a really nice functional bit of metal that um makes a plane fly yeah I mean I think what is really mind-blowing is just how many different little parts there are to this giant machine um like where do you fit in that whole machinery like what parts have you specifically worked on um, so it's all of the discs or anything that turns. So if you look at the front of an engine and you see the massive fan blades, um, the disc that holds all those blades in, that's what we make. And we also make the, the discs with, like further into the engine, um, which house the, the smaller little turbine and compressor blades. Um, so I th- we're, we're the most critical business sector because obviously, well, not obviously, but if, if a disc breaks, it needs to be able to either contain the blade um, or not split up into like bits. Because <laughs> um, I know there was a, a case in, I think it was like 2009 or something, where a, a disc that we'd actually made um, had overspan and split into three. And it literally like, it could have sliced the plane in half, but by it was it was totally lucky that it didn't. Um, but it wasn't our fault. It was, um, they'd, they'd not bored the pipe out um, concentrically so the yeah there was an oil leak but this but the thing is it wasn't our fault and I think the the biggest takeaway from that was our part was right and that's the importance of making it right um so I think yeah I, I always remind myself of that whenever I'm doing anything I'm kind of like no like this has to be right because you know a, a lot relies on it um which is it's scary but I think you know we're always really supportive at work everyone's there to help you um, and I think the the longer I've been there the, the more I have realized that um because I, I found it really daunting going up to people and asking questions and it sounds stupid but you know if someone's sat there doing work you don't want to disturb them you don't want to kind of you know bother them um but you, you have to like that that's one thing I have learned you, you know you've you've got to ask when you're not sure and yeah I'm, I'm a bit of a pest now <laughs> I will I will you know I'll go up and ask a million and one questions but it's necessary you know it's it's important so I think that's definitely a bit of advice I'll give anyone going into well going into any job but especially one if you're not sure just ask <laughs> what are you like as a air travel passenger <laughs> Um, pretty pretty chill to be honest. I think because yes. I, I, I know because I know what's gone into it, I I can kind of trust that it's not going to break. Um, but also I I love flying, so I I get a, a kick out of it anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm always eager to go on holiday. Yeah, I well, I went to New York a couple of years ago. Um, and they've got a Concorde in the Air Sea and Space Museum. Um. And I, I went round that because I, I was like, that's so cool. Like, I'd, I'd have loved to have flown on Concorde. Um, and, yeah, because and, I think we we made the engine for it as well. So I think it made it a little bit more special seeing it, thinking, like, you know, I work for the company who helped that fly at, like, Mach 2. So from your experience and, you know, being in the manufacturing scene, what about the way you do things is becoming smart um I think I think it's just I think digitalization is definitely a big aspect of it 
Um, so just since I've started with um, at up in Washington, we have implemented more like digital solutions. So say for tracking parts, um, it's on the shop floor. Everything's just kind of like in its own zone. Um, but because the part has to go through so many processes, it, it sounds stupid, but it is easily lost, um, like despite them being so big. Um, so we've got a, like a, a work in progress tracker um, in the factory now, which obviously is really handy. And I think that's a, a good example of kind of being more smart and like being more efficient as well. Um, and it, I think in general, we just are implementing more digital solutions. So like our paperwork, you know, it's, it's all on the cloud or online or on a, a database. Um, and obviously the, the art, like being able to use like Zoom or Teams to have calls, I think that's really benefited our industry as well. Um, because it's allowed people to work from home when they maybe weren't able to go into work um, or, you know, coll collaborate with people from Germany. So, for example, we, we do work with Germany a lot. Um, but now we've got Teams calls. It's obviously a lot easier and you can work together a lot better. Um, yeah, I think there's I think there's a lot of solutions that are coming in into play. And I think it's just about kind of embracing them like embracing the change and embracing what benefits it'll bring and especially with the younger generations coming through you know like where that like at work they always say apprentices are the future of the company so they impart their knowledge onto us and obviously that'll help us to keep rolls Royce going essentially um or yeah. keep other companies going yeah because <clears throat> I've always considered manufacturing to be like this big chunky kind of machine that's like you know pumping out a mass of stuff but actually yeah. it seems like um smart manufacturing is getting kind of cleaner um more nimble yeah Do you see that yeah definitely I think I mean efficiency definitely comes into it a lot but I think it's it's just taking out that like idle time really like looking so to say we, we monitor our machines quite a lot as well so looking at like downtime to say like when the machines are off why are they off um and what can we do to make sure they're not um you know increasing the productivity because um another example is our we had like a sister site in cross point in virginia um, and that had to shut due to covid um, so all of the load from that factories came into ours. Um, so it, it was another example of us. We had to adapt to that change, you know, take that work on, but also be, be more efficient because you, we can't just take work on without changing things. Um, so I think that forced a lot of change, but for the better. Um, and like you say, it is. I think it is just trying to make things as, as slick as possible and um just take out all of the unnecessary stuff really um, you're still using very old traditional uh tools right because there's also this thing of 3d printing like you know are we are 3d printers just gimmicks or is manufacturing incorporating 3d printers in some way no definitely not um we i think we, we do use our 3d printer um at work, the one we have, it, it's kind of a hobbyist printer and it was bought almost like as a trial to see, you know, if we had one, would we use it? Um, but we do. Um, we use it. So uh, one major use of it is to create masks for the parts to kind of cover the bits that don't need um, like processing. Um, and it, as well as part of like one of my uni projects, um, one of my units was additive manufacturing. Um, and I was kind of like tasked with creating a solution to a manufacturing problem. And um, so the, the one I chose was so on the, the measurement machines, we have pro like star probes. So basically just got like four prongs um, and they weren't aligning properly. So the like the shank of the probe has to be perfectly aligned with the um, like the probe tip that's in front of it. Um, but because they weren't quite aligned, the machine was stopping. It was causing a lot of downtime um, and the operators didn't know what was wrong. They didn't know how to fix it. Um, so I just made it was just a really simple little jig that you just sat the probe in um, and it aligned it for you. So 
but that was 3D printed. Um, so that was just like an example of how it can be used. And now there's no downtime because the star problem is aligned. Um, but there's, there's loads of little opportunities like that that come up um, within work. It's kind of just like an ad hoc basis. You know, if someone's got a problem, they'll escalate it. And then, yeah, we just try and come up with like a, a smart solution to it rather than buying in some expensive pit bit of kit that probably would do the same as say the little jig that I printed um so yeah and there's a lot of opportunity that jig that you printed were your older colleagues thinking what is she doing <laughs> you know, <laughs> like is there is there an embracing of new technology or um is this kind of like the norm um I mean I think they definitely did take the mick a little bit like oh what's that gonna do like I'll I'll believe it when I see it type thing um and I'm not I'm not saying the first one I made was perfect because it definitely wasn't you know there was a lot of um changing things and so I think that one of the biggest challenges with that particular task was that the probes are so small um and it, the three the resolution of the 3d printer wasn't good enough so that it was almost like collapsing on itself when it was printing the the hole for the probe to go down um so I think when it didn't work they were kind of like all oh, right like nice try <laughs> um but you know I, I persisted and I, I did get there and now you know it is in the inspection rooms and they do use it and it's got a little sticker on to say that I made it and um yeah they, they, they embraced it when it worked and they were they were happy that I'd came up with a solution to their problem um because they just yeah they, people kept complaining about it like what are you gonna do about it what are you gonna do about it and then when I kind of was like, this is what I've done about it, I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, um, it is really cool. And it's like yeah. so awesome that younger generations are providing these new solutions. It's- yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, like I say, the, um, like Rolls Royce is very much of the ethos that apprentices are the future. So I think they do probably make that extra effort with us and, you know, make sure that, we're as good as we can be um and let's say everyone's really helpful and they're they're always keen for us to improve the way they do things so I think that's a definitely a, a good place to be yeah I mean there's a real benefit to companies um encouraging apprentices into their industry because um you get this fresh talent uh but then you also get to tailor make your employees essentially um yeah. it's win-win on every front um i i have been so pleasantly surprised in talking to apprentices um about how much everyone involved benefits um but have you ever experienced any stigma about apprenticeships and if so what has that stigma been been and how have you uh dealt with it yeah um yeah I would definitely say that I've not experienced like adversity because of it but I think there's a lot of misconceptions around apprentice apprenticeships especially technical apprenticeships because they're so few and far between you know when you say I'm an apprentice people think that I'm, I basically go to work to make cups of tea and you know do crappy little jobs that nobody wants to do and um and it's not to say that um, I mean I don't know I can't speak for all companies but it's not like that where I work you know it's the opposite um like I was like I've been saying like people put the time in and people really they want to help you and they want to develop you um and I think like I know a lot of my friends are probably thinking why is she doing an apprenticeship like why can't she go to uni and um because I think uni's probably got more of the you know if, if you're academic you go to uni that that's essentially what it always has been um and I, and I know I have been to uni but I think having the added extra of an apprenticeship it kind of takes away from it and people think I've done like your fake degree or you know it's not as even though I have got a degree is it the same degree as someone who's gone to uni full-time and I think there's always that doubt and there's always that questioning but I think the only thing you can say is like I know what I've done I know that you know my my degree wasn't fake you know I I, I did study 
you know, I'm, I'm probably the same, I've got the same knowledge as someone who's gone to uni and done engineering. Um, but obviously with the added benefit of, I know my industry and, you know, I know how things actually work in real life. And I, yeah, I, I, honestly, I can't recommend apprenticeships enough. Anyone, so like my my nephew who's um, finishing college now, I, I think I've been persuading him to do one or, you know, look at other options. I think that's the important thing, not necessarily apprenticeship or uni, just consider your options and make sure that what you're doing is right for you. And yeah, I, I don't really care what anyone thinks, you know, if, if they think less of me for doing an apprenticeship, that's on them. That's, you know, it doesn't make a difference to me because I'm, I'm happy with the, like the route I've gone down. Yeah. I mean, uh, let's see how they do once um, they graduate graduate out of university and they're struggling to get their first job. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm uh, sure they won't. That, well, hopefully not. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it is it's it is really interesting because I've heard graduates um, who have done very academic routes um, struggle, you know, and it's, yeah. it's not, I don't say that in a spiteful way. I say that in a kind of, that's really tough kind of way because yeah. you've put so much money and so much time into getting those prestigious degrees. Um, but, you know, you're still you're still in that race of all other graduates trying to get into industry. And so I yeah. do find apprenticeships really, really smart. And I say that as someone that, you know, was seven and a half years doing back to back academic degrees um, and then didn't end up in industry purely because. I just didn't have the kind of experience that you're clocking up. So, you know, it's, I would love to be able to help change the stigma of apprenticeships. Um, And I really do feel like firsthand that universities um, with all the sort of like impressiveness that qualifications um, come with Mm -hmm. academically, like it just doesn't help true engineers you know engineers that are engineers at their core who really need to learn by being hands-on yeah definitely I I agree and as much as my degree helped me with like the fundamentals of understanding you know why things happen I think seeing things on the machine and you know seeing things actually being made that's what's made that's what's helped me understand and I mean even at work, if I've been shown something on the computer. So I I distinctively remember my first placement and I was given a drawing. Um, And because we make discs, it's literally just like the outline of the upper profile. And I was looking at it and I was thinking, how is that a disc? Like, what is that? Like, I, I just couldn't picture what I was looking at. And obviously the more you actually look at the part, the more you're like, oh, so that's that feature, that's that feature. And it kind of just all comes together when you see it. Um, same with so I've just came out of a programming placement um, and I was just looking at obviously like an outline of a disc on a on a page on a screen sorry um, and I was like programming these paths in and but I just couldn't picture how it was machining it and then I spent a week on the machine proving out a program that someone else had done um, and it just it just really solidified what I was actually doing and you know everything fell into place and I was like right I get it now um, but I think that's probably what y- you miss doing the more academic stuff. Um, I, I, I do think they're both as important as each other, to be honest. I, like, I, I do feel like I have benefited from the academic side and I, I enjoy learning. I enjoy, you know, studying. Um, like I'd love to do a master's. I'd love to go on through a PhD. But at the same time, I, I still want to be like in industry and seeing things actually happen rather than just you know, got my head in a book type thing. Yeah, I, I have to say that talking to you is really illuminating because you seem very academic, um, but at the same time, you just exude someone that is genuinely passionate about engineering. And it's such a joy to to hear your approach to your career because um you just are radiating this um, real passion for problem solving. 
So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad I come across okay. But um, yeah, I, I think I would agree though. I'd, like I would class myself as more academic than practical. Um, and I, I do find the benefits of being, of understanding things, but then also there's things that I've learned from people who are way more practical than me that I wish I was better at. Like I do wish I was better at the practical stuff sometimes, um, but it'll come with time. And I know, you know, the longer I'm in the industry, the longer I'll, the more I'll understand things. And yeah, I just, I, I try and just go into work every day and, and just soak up as much as I can. And, you know, that's why I do ask as many questions because I, I need to understand everything before I can apply things and um, and solve those problems. Like I'm very much a, a why, 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 why. And then as, as soon as people have stopped, like uh, as soon as I've stopped asking why and there's no more answers, I'm like satisfied with, right, okay, I understand it now. I can go and solve the problem, um, which I think is is important. You just keep, need to keep asking why. And I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned since, since starting. You are the future of manufacturing. Um, where do you see your career developing? I know you've talked about master's, PhD, but where do you want to see manufacturing heading in the UK? I think really it's just about looking to the to, to new ideas and kind of questioning the norm. I think that's the, probably the best way I can describe it because I think a lot of people accept things as being right just because that's how we do it and I think it's important to not sit idle and not just accept you know we we make a feature like that just because we always have you know we need to start thinking well why do we do it like that why can't we do it like this Um, and I think that's probably the the way manufacturing will develop and continue to be competitive and that's how you know say two companies that make the same thing that's why one will do better or one will you know come up with a solution that's innovative and gives loads of benefits and um and I think that's probably how the younger generation will help that so I think it's just making sure that we keep questioning things and I'm all like I know I've kept reiterating it but as an apprentice and my colleagues who are also apprentices were always encouraged to ask questions and and I think the older generations accept that we might come up with different solutions because we've grown up in a different era you know we've grown up with phones technology and thinking about things in that different way will help um and the same with digital I think digital solutions will be pivotal in like in progressing manufacturing as well um because it, it's a really important industry like you've said and to keep it competitive and to keep it moving it's just about making those small changes that will all amount to just a, like a, a better future of manufacturing really I think it's probably the, the best way of putting it I think <laughs> oh useful um so final question um would you recommend uh people women uh men to uh go into manufacturing and um what would be the best way in um yeah I mean I would recommend if I feel like if you're interested in how things are made how things work and you do have that kind of base of a a good understand of science and maths I do think that is really important um if you're interested in those sorts of things 100% get into manufacturing um because I think it's as as much as people can say everyone should go into it no everyone shouldn't go into it you know you, you need to be interested in it and I think that's how you stay engaged is being genuinely interested um and I, like I would recommend it to anyone you know female male whoever you are if you if you want to do it 100% do it and I also think um age as well doesn't matter because I think there's also the misconception that as an apprentice you have to be 16 or 18 but 
what you know we have a lot of older apprentices and they've got a lot more experience in other industries or in other job roles that's really helped them um so I think that's another misconception that needs to be kind of get moved away from um and route wise I think I think an apprenticeship would be the most logical route in especially with engineering because I think the apprenticeship schemes they lean themselves very much to practical jobs um so yeah so I think for my particular role I do think an apprenticeship would be the most yeah logical is probably the best way of putting it way to go in but there are also you know you can be a graduate and come in and we have got a lot of graduates who um who have that maybe extra academic knowledge and that's really helped them um but likewise, just, you know, getting a job. I think whatever route you come in, the the company I would hope would invest enough time and money and effort into training you that it doesn't really matter where you've come from. It's about, you know, you you learning and you putting the effort in to be good at your job. So um, any, any route is totally fine and will totally work. But maybe if you want to not have any debt and get maybe that extra bit of experience I do think apprenticeships are probably the, the the best way to go well I must say Kate you're a total poster child for um engineering uh <laughs> your passion your interest your ability um and your kind of vision uh for the future of manufacturing is really inspiring and um I don't know like listening to you I'm like oh gosh I want to go into manufacturing because it just seems like such a um kind of a fruitful and rich industry to be in um that's ever changing and evolving and to be at the forefront of that must be so exciting so thank you for sharing your experiences with us and um good luck for your career it sounds like it's taking off hopefully <laughs> yeah I'm um... I'm, I think I'm in a good position at the moment um, to keep going into manufacturing and yeah I think at the end of the year I'm, I'm hoping I will get a job and I can just continue down the route and yeah fingers crossed it'll all go well. I'm sure it will. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening and please do subscribe to this podcast and maybe even rate and review it if you can. The more ratings and reviews, then the more interest from those trusty algorithms, which could help to increase the reach of this show. And you can watch the video recording of this conversation on YouTube on my new series called Esteemed. It's all about self-discovery, self-evolution and inclusivity on innovation. Let's all strive to be in the best versions of ourselves and celebrate others being themselves too. As always, be kind and loving, and I wish you all a great week.